this is me, uh, in case you couldn't tell. Uh, I'm a fourth grade teacher at Pine Grove Elementary School. It's one of the three public elementary schools in Avon, Connecticut. Uh, you can reach me on email or on Twitter. If, uh, if you have to step out, that's fine. The uh, website where you can get it is, Mo I didn't write it up here, but it's Moss Teaches, one word, mossteaches.us slash edtech. So feel free, like I said, we'll be up there at the end. So today, uh, I'm talking about a project. And I want to start off uh, actually letting you know where this project came from and how it start. It all started with Sika 2010, which is, I believe, before Sika and Castle teamed up to the conference. So five years ago, I was in a session with the presenter, and I really wish that I knew exactly who the presenter was, but I can give this person proper credit. If it's you or if you know who it is, please let me know. Please apologize that I haven't been given credit. But I was in this session, and this person was talking about new and interesting ways that kids can present their learning instead of just a poster or a book report. How they can come up with a way to share their information in a way that's creative and interesting. And one that stuck with me that I can give you as an example is a website, Blogster, which if you're not familiar with it, is a website that lets you make a virtual poster. So you can embed a YouTube video, you can bring in multimedia and different kinds of graphics and text and really have an interactive component because these are new and they're innovative and they're motivating. And I sat there in that session thinking each one of these is really cool, but how can I work all of these in? How can I come up with a way to develop a project where the kids can really pick something that's motivating? Because for some kids, Globster might be the coolest thing they've ever done in school. And for other kids, they may just look at it, and to no fault of Globster, and to no fault of their own, it may not resonate with them in the same way. So how can I come up with a one-size-fits-all method, which of course is very different from what normally happens in the schools, where far away from one size fits all. How can I come up with something, I'm going to use the term that I coined, self-differentiated. Which, boy, if that really exists, what a great thing that would be. How great would it be if we come up with lessons that are self-differentiated? So if that is such a thing, I think that what I'm going to share with you is going to um, get kind of close to it. So the project started off in 2010, and as time went on, I thought about it more and more and more. And so that year, I came up with kind of four objectives. If I had to come up with this project that would hit everything that I wanted, what would those goals be? And the first one, something that fostered creativity in choosing a research topic and a method of sharing. So often, we assign those topics to kids. You have to do a biography, or it's a project about one of the 50 states, or it's about a particular piece, and then your child may not have that motivation going into it. You may have just taken away a big part of that motivation just by handing them a topic. So I really wanted something where they would have the opportunity to exercise their creativity in choosing both a research topic and a method of presenting the data, the uh, research. I wanted kids to develop time management skills during a long-term project. Uh, the best example here, let's see if I happen to have, you know I have a pen that clicks shut? It's what are you right no? Okay, um, the kind of the well, it's okay. Imagine a Crayola marker, uh, you know, regular marker that we've had forever. The best example that somebody gave me is when we, who here is an elementary level teacher? Okay, so the best example is when we, oh, thank you, student <laughs> teacher helping me out here. <laughs> so when we yell at kids for putting a marker or a pen back in the marker container with the lid off of it. And you yell at the kids, you didn't put it in. And then what about though when kids put the marker on, but they don't give that final <laughs> flip. And you're saying, oh, the marker dries out, and then the lid falls off, and then it makes a big mess. And the reality is, did we ever take time to teach kids that? And I do too, even in fourth grade. Because you can always assume that kids have these skills, but if they don't actually have them, if no one took time to give that explicit instruction to kids, you're just making a big old assumption that maybe isn't warranted. And to me, that's uh, the same idea with time management skills. We can give them a calendar. We can give them deadlines. That doesn't mean that you've taught them anything. It doesn't mean you've given them the skills. It means you've given them a sheet of paper with a whole bunch of numbers. And by the way, when's the last time any of us actually taught a lesson subsequent to kindergarten or first grade on how to read a calendar? <laughs> We don't do that a whole lot. And yet calendars are all over, and as much as we all have technology, calendars aren't going away. We want to help students to build problem-solving skills. No kidding. I mean, that's, we talk about that so very much. So we had to include that, and I think it really is a crucial piece. But what does problem-solving skills look like? 
Let's remember, problem-solving skills are Mark has three apples, he doubles the number of apples that he has, and then gives three of them to his friend Betty. How many apples does he have? Three. So it's still, it's still <laughs> problem-solving, but is that the kind of problem-solving we need? Problem-solving kind of gets this catch-all term in education. And the fourth one is to increase student motivation yeah. and excitement. And let's be honest, folks, which one of these is the most important goal up here? You'll notice that when we look at the form, you're right, all of them are, I know, but I have to be honest, this is my favorite one. Because we all know when a kid is motivated and excited, they're already on the path to doing better than if you hand them something. Now you'll notice if we look at all four of these goals, does any single one of these hit a content area? Does any one of these talk about a social studies skill or a content piece that would affect the topic of it? None of these do. So this whole pro project is predicated on the idea that the kids get that free choice in what excites them in the topic. In fact, today, I made a last minute, I don't know if I'm the only presenter where I keep making edits up until about 10 minutes before I start speaking. So Angela Mares was talking this morning, and uh, she was talking so much about exciting kids, getting them uh, you know, involved in the idea of digital literacy. And on her website, she has the concept of a genius hour. I'm going to ask you to take about 20 seconds just to kind of scan through this information right on her website. So, so many of us have heard about how Google trusts its engineers and empowers its engineers to work on pet projects. The idea is if you really trust your people, the directions that they're going to go in have the potential lead to great things. Why can't we give our students that same respect of saying, if we empower them to take their learning in their own direction, what incredible things will they come up with? Uh, the idea of a passion project. And that really aligns with what we're talking about here. The idea of pick a topic that you're interested in and run with it. So what's the assignment? That's the entire assignment. It's also the name of the assignment. Teach us something, somehow. That really sums it up, doesn't it? And do we have enough packets? Did everyone get one? No? So I've got, uh, yeah. I mean, you know what I'm just going to do? If, would you be mind just holding on to those and if people want to spread them around? Or, there you go. We have some extras in the back there. So the packet that you have is a sample. It has all the dates and stuff filled in. So you're not going to be able to use that for yourself, but it kind of gives you a visualization. But that's the whole assignment. Now, if you take a look at that packet, can you borrow one? Yeah. Okay. If you take a look at it, you'll notice that it's a thick packet. And if it's copied single-sided the way I normally do, you're looking at 16 pages. That's a whole lot more than one sentence. Four words. Teach us something somehow. That's the assignment. Everything else is elaboration. Everything else is a clarification. It's extra detail. But that's the whole assignment right there. So the question is, and of course this is the million dollar question, is this a school project or a home project? I'm going to ask you this. When I give you my answer, please don't, when you see my answer, get up and walk out of here. If you think, well, that wouldn't, you guys know where I'm going with this. Please don't walk out because I'm going to give you strategies to do either one of these. But we chose to make it a home project. And there were several different reasons why we went in this direction. One of those reasons is because we didn't have an existing research project with which to integrate. We couldn't just say, oh, we normally do such and such. Let's just kind of embed TUS within it and integrate the two, because most curricula do not include a research project of pick a topic, pick a method, and go. So we did have a way to integrate it, which means there was no time in our instructional schedule to embed this in there. The second uh, reason is because we felt that in our community, parents were really able and interested in being involved to the point of being able to provide valuable support for the kids. Parents have a lot of background, parents have resources. In whatever way they'd like to, parents can provide valuable support to kids. And when we first started this in 2011, we didn't really have a great deal of technology which would limit student options. For example, if a child wanted to make a movie or a video about something, we didn't have iPads at the time, we didn't have iMovie, we didn't have even digital video cameras for kids to be able to film stuff. So kids who wanted to take that in the direction of using educational technology really would have to rely on using their home resources. So for us, we made the choice, and that first it was 
me, it was just my class, I piloted it myself. I had to make the choice to make this a home project. Please don't walk out just because of that. If you're in a school system where you're thinking, yeah, this would need to be an in-school assignment, that's fine, I'll give you plenty of strategies to make it work in your setting. Oh yeah, I forgot an objective here. <laughs> don't panic parents. Because I know we all love getting those panicky emails from a parent where they say, well, wait a minute, how do I, you know, we don't want to panic parents. Open-ended projects like teach us something somehow. Frighten parents. Can you imagine sending home an assignment sheet? Your kid has to make a project where they teach us something somehow due in two months and go. It would panic parents, and let's be honest, it would frighten a lot of kids too. We thrive on that structure, and as adults, we really are used to getting that structure. Kids, they tend to be, cool, so I can pick a topic and pick a method and come back? Okay. They're set. The adults want that structure, and that's what the project provides. So I came up with a lot of different scaffolds and supports for the project. The first is a group introduction and reflection. So the first year I introduced it to my class as a whole. In subsequent years, I introduced it to our entire grade as a whole. Because I think whenever it comes together, everyone's getting the same bit of information. So I go through and I hand them a copy of the packet, the same one that you guys have. And the first thing I say to them after I explain it is the topic. No, really, you get to pick what you want. Really? Yeah, no, really, you get to pick what you want. The rules are it has to be appropriate for school. And we all know what that, and that's what I say to them is, we all know what that means. We all know that there are some things that aren't appropriate for school, right? Yeah. And two, no, wait, just that one. They're like, really? And, I, and then I say, okay, guys, I dare you. Come up with a topic that I won't approve. Oh, the, the history of mint flavored toothpaste. History of toothpaste? That's pretty cool. Why mint? Why not another flavor? Why did mint become? I'd be okay with that project. In fact, anyone here want to throw out an idea? Something totally far fetched and wacky? Think about your own interests. Think about what things you have as a hobby and where, if you could just do anything, what you would do. I wouldn't do this, but one of my seventh graders would. Um, I almost said no. Sarah Albee's book is on. She wrote a whole book. That's kind of why I wrote it. I knew we had the book. And so if that's, of course, we rely on our understanding of that student. Could we trust them to do a really interesting presentation to keep it mature, but to teach us about that? Or is the student just going to go down the gutter? And if they could handle it, I'd be okay with that. If they could handle it, and of course, if we could make sure that our class could handle it. Any other ideas anyone wants to throw out? I mean, I'm thinking like pop culture. You know, I want to do my project on minions. Okay, so that's what I turn to the student and say. Actually, you know, can I come back to that? Because I'm going to totally get to that in just a second. So the first year I did, I had the kids write some reflections after. Now, of course, the premise is these kids are writing for their teacher about a project the teacher just assigns. And yes, I'm showing you their responses from the kids who wrote something that I want to share with you. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, everyone wrote something positive. So you have that piece. But right here, I think this project is the best project ever. Finally, a long-term project that I'm actually prepared for. I have the topic buzzing around in my head. The greatest artist of all time, Pablo Picasso. Which reminds me, I have to give that student their $20 bribe. <laughs> <laughs> I like this project because in all of my other assigned projects, they've all been so specific and strict. This one is unique by letting me be so loose and flexible. Also, I'm thinking about doing something that interests me, Pompeii. That's why I think this is a great project. This project is awesome, it's creative, and it has almost no limits, it's the best assignment ever. I, think, I feel like when they put it all in caps, that's really them that coming through, that's not them current thing. I like it because for once it's a project where I can teach something to others in almost any way. I love this project. Um, I'm so excited to show my parents and tell them about the idea I'm thinking about. They want to go home and tell their parents about a big assignment they got. When's the last time we had a kid tell us that about a book report about Beverly Cleary? I love Beverly. So I put in these two for a particular reason. I think this project is good because you get to do what you want. Another reason I like these assignments is you don't have to do it on a poster. I get it. We love posters. We teach ourselves posters. I mean, they're easy to bring to school, kind of. They, they, they're thin, you can stack them, easy to keep in a pile of gray, they can get hung up very simply, four little rolls of tape and you're done, and you can assess it, it's great, they present to the class, while they present we grade it, come on we all do, let's be honest. Posters are a really convenient tool for teachers to use, but enough already, I mean, come on, by the time they get to fourth grade they've probably made 40 or 50 
panels and posters. Um, this last one, I'm loving it so much. I have the perfect idea. I think very cool. It fits with my personality. And that's that fourth goal, something where it's their interests guiding what they're doing with their project. So then here comes the assignment packet. Now, I admit, when I look at this assignment packet that you guys all have, my first thought is, this is 21st century. I mean, it's words. And, and oh, oh, calendars and words. Oh, look, a rubric and words. And oh, a worksheet for them to oh, more worksheets. And hey, look at that, more worksheets. And oh, worksheets. And oh, don't we love, oh, and a parent signs on the bottom and tears it off and brings it in. We know we love those. This doesn't look very 21st century. This doesn't look like it's really that helpful. But let me go through it kind of quickly. I'm not going to read through all of this. I'm going to show you how I broke it down. The first part, it's written as a memo. It's written to students and their families from their teacher. We put in the name of whatever teacher it's from. And we're explaining that their whole assignment is to teach us something somehow. Yes, that's right. Your assignment is a simple one. Teach us something using some interesting technique. That's it. Everything else is explanation. So let me get into the topic. Their topic can be anything as long as it's appropriate for school. We talked about that. Your method. You can come up with anything. You can write, make a poster or a written report, but let's face it, been there, done that. So I give them a whole bunch of different ideas that they could use, but then I said, or just about anything else. I really want them to be creative. Now, for those of you who are thinking about this may or may not fit in my school district, nothing here says it has to be a high-tech project. There's nothing here that says it has to be high-tech. The first year that I did it, 75% of kids chose to do a project that in some way involved technology, and that percentage went up. But it doesn't have to be the case for you. If you're doing this in school, if you don't have access to technology, choose other methods. Be creative. Come up with all kinds of funky, cockamamie ways that they can do it here. They can still turn over a speech. They can create a model. They can write a song. They can create an animation in ways that don't involve educational technology. There are plenty of different directions that they could go. Objectives, I wanted to make sure that I communicated this to kids and then in turn to parents. So the same things that I mentioned before are included on the first page of the packet. And then other things to know. So we really go through here uh, bits of information that we want them to know. We read through this together as a class. And part of the assignment is I give the kids about a week to go over this packet with their parents. Because we don't want to make this a, here's the packet, here you go, best of luck, read it over. Because that's not helpful. We really want to support students during this, so it's a learning opportunity. Speaking of making it a learning opportunity, giving them a project on April 13th and telling them that it's due on June 1st is not supporting students. That's giving them a long project and then going on with your Common Core instruction, making sure they can get SBAC done in between the two. That's not helpful. So we really break it down into small pieces so that kids can track what they need to work at. Dividing this big, potentially overwhelming project into small, accomplishable, I know that's not a word, I've made it into word, the power of a teacher, accomplishable <laughs> pieces that they can actually complete. So I give them a calendar. The uh, template for this is all on my website, so you'll be able to use this and modify it as you need. But you can see it really breaks down what's due on a given date and what should they be working on. Projects is like key brainstorming ideas. Oh, bring in your signed parent letter, but key brainstorming ideas. Parent information session, key brainstorming ideas. Proposals due. So it really shows them what's due when and what should they be working on at a given time. I make sure that I put in some notes, some hints. I remind them what they could be doing during some of those long weeks when they have the potential to say, oh, gee, I've got two weeks. Well, I can go out and do whatever I want. We don't want them working on this 24 hours a day, but we also want them making steady progress. And then the forms, yes, forms. <laughs> so I, I admit, I was uh, going through this uh, presentation with my wife yesterday, getting her input, because you know that her input matters most of all. But please give me good, honest feedback, too. But so I was going through with my wife, and she said, well, that's helpful, because how do you fill out a form? Think about it. Here we are in 2015. You're still filling out forms. When do kids actually learn what that means to fill out a form? I'm going to give you an example. So I go through the forms on the main page, and we discuss it as a class. And there was a question earlier about uh, minions. Could you pick the minions? And there's a part here where we talk about the idea proposal form. And I say it has to include new learning for you. While it's okay that your topic may be familiar, it must also include new learning for you. For example, imagine you're a huge fan of video games and you want to teach us about that. You may already know a lot about the current games on the Wii, PlayStation, and Xbox, but maybe you can learn about the history of video games. So if this person knows a lot about minions and they can do it from memory, then maybe your challenge for them 
is to take it in a different direction so that there is that new learning piece. How do you magically decide if there's new learning inside of a kid's mind? Because we don't know what their prior knowledge is. That comes in the course of discussions with students. So we have the idea of proposal form. It's condensed here to fit there on the form. You can see there are plenty of lines for them to write their answers. The topic I'd like to teach the class, I think this would be interesting because the method I would like to use to teach the class and student signature. On here it says on Petunia. On Petunia is the generic name I use for the grown-ups at home. Instead of saying, get your mom to sign it, or dad, or grandma, or grandpa, or aunt, or uncle, or guardian. We just call them on Petunia. So we have the opportunity to sign off on it, and then it comes to me. And if I approve it, they're off and running. Otherwise, they have to make a revision. Requested to work as partners. Same idea. Working as partners has actual value. It's something that we need to teach kids. I had two students last week, who got into, uh, two weeks ago, who got into this conflict where they pulled me and told me, Mr. Moss, she's copying my answers. Well, no, she did the whole thing and wasn't working with me at all. And Either one of them realizes the idea of group work is you do each step together and pull resources, put your heads together to work collectively. So I will rarely, but I will, let kids work as partners. Why? This is also where we teach the kids the concept of fine print. Hey, where's that pop up? Okay, it totally should be there. Okay, let's go with Tempe. I know you guys can't see it too, too well right here. But what I'm saying is they have to consider the following items. This is, like I said, the fine print. First of all, there must be a reason for working together besides sharing the workload. Something where someone brings something to the table, someone else brings something else to the table, and by collaborating, you're able to accomplish a bigger and better project than what either of you could do on your own. I don't mean bigger and better like flashier. I mean you truly could go in a direction that neither one of you could have done if you were working solo. The second consideration is that all work must be shared equally. You can't have one partner doing the research, the other partner making the presentation. Neither partner is in charge, so conflicts may come up when you both have creative ideas. You need to be prepared to problem solve when these conflicts happen. I will not allow partners to split up. If you start off together, you finish together. Such an important concept. And then the kids are going in with their eyes open. And so are the parents. We have a packed school day. I cannot provide in-school time for you to work on your project. And this has happened. Kids start being partners together, and the parent says, hey, you know, we have soccer practices, and they have swim practice, and we haven't been able to get them together to work on it. Can, can you let them come in during recess with you and kind of have some time? And I have to tell the parent, no. I'm in meetings. I've got PLCs. Come on, we all do. <laughs> so parents need to know, and kids need to know, this is a home-based assignment. And the last one is that there's a, a single grade being given. I'm not giving multiple grades for multiple kids. If all of these uh, working in partnerships can be a wonderful opportunity unto itself, if the five other conditions in this fine print seem manageable to you, then working with the partner may be a great idea. All parties involved sign their names, and we see if Mr. Moss, see, that's what should have done right there. Is that a nice transition? As they're working, I want them to keep track of sources. This is a revision that I made midway through this, uh, maybe three years ago. I realized that they're getting their information, and I'm not keeping track of where they're getting their information. And as I'm sure so many teachers do, am I fact-checking each and every source? No. But that way, if I go and I'm questioning the accuracy or the originality of some of what they're writing, I can go and check. Have I had issues of plagiarism? Yes. So then they do a midway private supporting. Uh, this is the example that I wanted to give you before about teaching kids forms. Name, topic, method. Check off what you've done so far. Write a few sentences telling you what you've accomplished so far. Okay, that's where it goes well. What questions do you have? What problems uh, have you had? What can my teacher do to help you? <laughs> Anyone want to take a guess what I often see for these two questions? Nothing. Nothing! <laughs> and of course, we know when you're filling out a form, it's the worst thing you could do. Write nothing, because then they return it to you, and it's incomplete. And it's teaching the kids, well, how do you respond to that then? Now we're getting into some pragmatics, some social language. Instead of just saying, oh, nothing, and leaving it blank, you can say, uh, I'm all set right now, but thank you. Or if I have any questions, I'll let you know. Or, you know, putting in that instruction. This is a whole lot more than a how-to do research. This is getting into social language and interactions. Very similar to the progress, the final progress report, except by signing this page, I pledge that this project is my own work. Other people may have helped me along the way, which is fine, uh, but the product I'm turning in is my own work and I created it. 
and then my favorite sentence, this is my best work and I'm proud to hand it in. And I really tell them, do not sign that if it's not true for you. And then the parent signs it also saying that it's uh, the student's own work. It's okay to get parental support. You'll see some samples of that in a few moments, but we want it to be their own work. And then at the end, there's a program page. So when we present all of these, when we share these, we turn our room into a little museum. You'll see uh, some photos in a moment. And each exhibit, we call it, gets a little letter. And in the program book, we have their page where they really explain all of this information, and they're able to share uh, with the rest of the class what they're proud of and what they've done. So we have these family information sessions, and those happen uh, so that parents have the opportunity to ask any questions they want. We physically invite them to come into the school, and I'm there, and I pretty much say, give me any question. And I do that at the very beginning of the project while they're still brainstorming ideas, because regrettably, depends on how you look at that, parents are not in the classroom when we're introducing this to students. So really, it's an opportunity for them to get almost the same introduction that we're giving to kids. We have the uh, scoring rubric that we provide to kids ahead of time that we go through. The idea is, I think it says that somewhere, maybe it's in the packet, pick the score you want and work together. I have to tell you guys, that's not the big focus here. You know, it's not a project where I'm looking at the grade, where I'm looking at what score am I going to give? Ooh, is it a three point or is it a two point? It's really about getting them through the process rather than the product. So then there's a support website. I have a website that I've created on my class website uh, to help kids with the projects. And I'll show it to you quickly. Um, once again, if you have to step out for any reason, here's my website. Just replace the TUS with EdTech, and that gets you to all the resources for today's session. But if I point myself over here, so here's my uh, page on the class website. It's not a particularly beautiful page here, but it lets them download the packet if they need it. It gives them the program page as a Word document so they can type in their answers. I should turn that into a Google. But here's the cool part. Anytime a kid or a parent asks me a question, I don't answer it. Instead, I take their question, I put it into the frequently asked questions section so that this gets bigger and bigger and bigger every year so that everyone else can benefit from it. And so we've got everything from getting started, how do you pick your method, how do I find my information, where do I find my information? Uh, I don't know how to do the technology that I picked. How do I make a website? How do I answer YouTube videos? How do I make my Prezi look good? Uh, how can I share my product with my teacher? I filmed it using a video camera. What do I need to bring on the due date? Do I need to write a script for my presentation? What am I presenting? And so forth. <clears throat> These kids are fourth graders? They're fourth graders. I don't know who I'm making eye contact with, sorry. Fine. There you go, fourth graders. Okay, now here's the time for the video. So, Anyone here are cringing when I say six hours? <laughs> Anyone have six hours of instructional time to kind of kill doing something? I, I don't have six extra hours. Here's the cool part. So you're thinking, six hours? How big is this guy's class? Right, for six hours, an average presentation takes between 15 and 30 minutes. And you're thinking, wow, that's the amount of information the kids have to share. That's how in-depth their research is. Who's ever done oral presentations in class, and by the time the 18th kid is presenting, you're shooting spitballs at a kid to wake them up <laughs> because they're sick of hearing about Beverly Cleary's books. I mean, I love Ramona, but enough Ramona! Because each one of these projects is unique about a different topic and oftentimes using a different method, the kids are attending the entire time. I literally never have to say to these kids, hey, come on, quit reading a book, pay attention. They're really interested. Because think about it, they're fourth graders picking topics that fourth graders care about. So let me show you a few examples. All right, so right over here is a project that a student did about the Philippines. His method was making a Prezi. Now, this is an interesting one to start with because you guys, if you're familiar with Prezi, you know it's kind of powerful. So how is that new and innovative? Well, what makes Prezi different? If anyone here familiar with Prezi? Okay, so a lot of you are. But if you're not, the premise of Prezi is that everything, rather than being individual slides, everything's on a single canvas. And you're laying stuff out, you're zooming in, zooming out. You could be really creative. Let's say you're showing a diagram of a process. First, you can embed YouTube videos, which when we started, you couldn't do that in PowerPoint easily. Um, but let's say you're showing the process from A, arrow, to B. You can zoom into the arrow as you're discussing that change, and there's some content. So for kids who really have that artistic quality, this is a great way to give them an opportunity to really showcase uh, their interests and their talents beyond the topic. So if we 
this for a little. Uh, this student made uh, a, a presentation about Hebrew. That was really exciting to him. And he said, well, Mr. Moss, I just want to teach it. Like, you know, how you teach it. It's my teacher style. OK. I don't normally present up a poster, but you know, hey, he went with it. <laughs> well, and I'll tell you exactly why he did a poster. He wanted to do a smart board lesson. And I'm thinking, OK. But then, you know, if you guys do ed tech, you know the licensing for smart notebook is a whole big pain. And so I love smart. Sorry, if there are any smart people here, I love you guys. Um, but so he went with this as a fallback. He was problem solving. In earlier, and I kind of went through it quickly earlier, it actually says, a student who responsibly comes to me with a problem will never lose points. And that's 100% true. If I have to sit with a student every single day and help them, they can still get a top score because they're being responsible. They're asking for help, which we all want our students to do when they need it. And so he originally wrote it to be a smart board. It didn't work. He switched to a poster. This student did a poster, an interactive poster, about currency. It doesn't need to be high tech. He researched it. He's presenting it to us using an interactive poster. I love horse touch. <laughs> OK, this, this one's exciting. This is a young lady. Remember, the project's assigned in, I think this year I assigned it in early March, maybe, and then it was due in May. This young lady did a project about the Boston Marathon. Why? Her mom was a marathon runner, and she was going to be running in the Boston Marathon that year, in 2011. So she planned out this whole piece that when they went to Boston for Marathon Monday, they'd shoot footage at different places, and they planned ahead of time, okay, we want to get a shot here, and shot here, an interview, and do this. She's getting a shot right here along the marathon route, or it looks like on the side of the marathon. Route. How cool to take something that was so special to the family, give her an opportunity to share that with her whole class. Her mom is excited. That's her brother. She's in high school now. Um, but I mean, what a cool opportunity that was to give her a chance to bring something that was so special to her and to share it. And more than just morning meeting, let's share some good news, to make it part of a school project. It was an outstanding project. And again, in addition to learning more about the Boston Marathon, she also learned how to make a movie. Now, another reason why this is good is that if you have a student who tends to be very modest, who doesn't like to present in front of the class, use an opportunity for, their makes, for them to make something where all the report, all the narration, all the information is done ahead of time, so they just kind of stand there and smile during the presentation. They don't have to speak, and for a lot of kids, it makes them feel better. This young man, you know how hard it is for me not to use student names here? <laughs> this young man went to the National Mall on his spring break, back when we had all those spring breaks. And he went and he researched all of the many locations, the landmarks in the National Mall. And what schools, he turns it into a comic book using a great program called Comic Life. If you don't know it, it's worth writing down. Comic Life rocks. And you can see he's got the Lincoln Memorial narrating information about the National Mall. Anyone here think that he didn't learn a whole lot doing it? But he also had a ton of fun doing it. So how cool was that? That's for Okay, this young lady did a report about the, I'm sorry, project. I have to stop saying the word report, I sometimes slip. She did a project about the Chrysler Building, which is my favorite building in the whole wide world. I love the Chrysler Building. Um, so she did it about the Chrysler Building. She learned about the history of the Chrysler Building. She wrote a uh, written component for all of us, and then you'll notice that she made a model of the Chrysler Building. Now I'm going to zoom in for a second, or I'm just going to fast forward to when I zoom in. Look at the detail in that. Is there anyone who thinks that a fourth grader made that all by yourself? <laughs> and that's fine for a few reasons. A, I knew about it ahead of time. And B, why are we upset when parents help their kids if it's part of the activity? Here's a skill that her dad had. So this young lady learns about the Christ, but she also learns about how to work with balsa wood and how to make an intricate model. Anyone notice anything else about this model as we scroll up towards the top? I'm sure that you've all seen the Chrysler building and you're all familiar with it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you notice? It's not, it's not done. And that was fine. This student reached out to me. She reached out, not mom or dad, she did. She reached out to me a couple, uh, about maybe two weeks before the project was due. Say, Mr. Moss, we've been working really hard on it, but sometimes it takes a while to be glued to try. We're making really good progress on it. I'm not sure that we're going to have it done in time. The learning was still happening. The responsible project management was having definitely responsible. She was coming to me with a problem. I was fine with that because she said, I'm going to keep on working after I present. I'm going to get it done. She handled it appropriately. She got great credit on it. And I was really proud of her project. 
These two kids teamed up together to research Germany. They had different skill sets that they brought to it. They made a poster. Once again, it doesn't have to be a high-tech project. And then they also had a staff member in the building who <coughs> had been in Germany. She had some German clothes, so she modeled some of the different German clothes. I don't know if that's in here. She made a bribe to me. Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> Super. Uh, a basketball player from UConn. This student did a newspaper poster about Sue Bird. So Richie was going to be a newspaper, and then she came to me and said, Mr. Thomas, if it's a newspaper, people aren't going to see it. Can I make it bigger? Once again, she was responsible. She was anticipating challenges. She reached out to me. Of course I'm going to let her make that change. Uh, this is about the Outer Banks. So it's a, uh, essentially a slideshow that the student made an iMovie, and then they narrated over. Again, if a student doesn't like speaking in front of a group, it's a great strategy. So this student made a Prezi about the rainforest, and then, at the end of her Prezi, she made an interactive game, and that sparked it. Because at no point when I was making the packet and I was recommending different methods did I think, put a game, make a game. Holy mackerel. Every year I have so many kids who make a game at the end of the presentation to see what kids retained. Assessment, anyone? <laughs> I feel like they should be getting some course credits for college. They are making assessments to see it. I swear, this year I'm going to teach my kids the word SLO. Just to see if they can work it. <laughs> my IHED is whether they can climb to the top of the uh, rainforest successfully with 80% success as measured by the SVAC scores. Okay, so this student did a project about pie. Not pi, but 3.14159265B5. How far can you guys go? Wow. So he did a project about pi. He made a commercial. A commercial about pi. A commercial about pi. It was really cool. He explained it to us and he marketed pi as if, why do you need pi? Here's why you need pi. How cool was that? And yes, of course. Does pi fit into Common Core? Yes, it does. <laughs> this was in the days before Common. Pompeii, just the Pompeii presentation. Like the others, this was one where the student did a video slideshow and then uh, narrated it, but at the end, actually in the middle, she had moments where she paused like that, win-win, she uh, took an image off the web. Great opportunity to talk about giving credit to your sources. But it was then just a series of questions, broke the class into two sides, gave points. Just a fun, easy way to keep everyone actively engaged, and it worked, and the kids gave out little trinkets as uh, prizes. If they chose to, again, students selected. Here. Oh, there's the game. Okay, African dance. This is a student who took African dance. So this comes back to that topic of what about if they're familiar? She knows African dance. She's been taking it, but here's an opportunity for her to delve further into it and to share some of it with the class. And then there was a quiz at the end. This student wanted to do a PowerPoint about New York City. Imagine how far we've come in the field of educational technology when a kid comes and says, I want to do a PowerPoint, and we think, oh, really? Just a PowerPoint? <laughs> But that's where we are in 2015. A PowerPoint is old school. Just take a moment to think about that. I think that's a really great thing. But I don't think there's anything wrong with a PowerPoint. And this student did a really terrific job. Here's Pablo Picasso. Another great example back when parents support their kids. So here's a situation where she wanted to make a website. But that has the potential to be kind of overwhelming. So her dad happened to be a web developer. He <laughs> took, yeah, convenient. I know, I'll be like, he, her dad was a web developer. He made the framework of the website, but then she modified it to be her project. She did the work. She just took a template that already existed. I was fine with that. She did the research. She interviewed our, our teacher right there to learn more about Pablo Picasso. So again, she's learning not just about Pablo Picasso, but she's learning about how to build a website, how to select media, how to record, how to edit it. So many 21st century skills in addition to, oh yeah, Pablo. A uh, website here, a blog about cheerleading. How to write a song. He made a video walking us through the steps of writing a song. Guess what his passion was? He still does. Since we stay in touch with kids. Here is a uh, video about Pele. It was a narrated video with a quiz game, kind of similar to some of the ones that I showed you already. These two girls worked together about um, photography. 
And this comes back to the idea of working with partners. One of the young ladies had taken a photography for kids class. The other young lady had an aunt who was a professional photographer. A perfect example of collectively, they were able to develop a more thorough, more interesting, more successful project than what either of them could do by themselves. And I was really happy to support that project. And then the last one here, are these two uh, gentlemen who worked together to teach us about Lego. First they had a PowerPoint to teach us about old Kirk Christensen who invented the Legos. And then they had a video here where my friend here goes into his time machine, which looks an awful lot like a tent for time machine, <laughs> went back in time to interview old Kirk Christensen. Let's go for these two guys! <laughs> walk down memory lane for me seeing these guys. And so those are just some examples of what the kids were able to come up with in year one. And then now imagine four other years beyond that. So for sharing, in addition to presenting to the entire class, we come up with the fourth grade research colloquium. And I really wanted to make it sound like a fancy you know, mm. conference, kind of like what we're at now, because that's really what we do. So we set up our research colloquium on open house site. We invite all the families to come in. And we set up our room so that students have stations to present their projects to the rest of the class. And as you can see, you were kind of scratching my all the technology. I was going into my basement and my attic, taking every old device I had and coming up with, okay, if I save this under a new format, and maybe it was an ambitious process. This is all before oh we had the days of Chromebook carts where you could just like, take 24 Chromebooks and put them into the room. This is pulling from all over. You'll notice that each of the uh, each of those exhibits has a letter on the top, and those correspond to, here's the program book from the first year that I did this. Each of their program pages has a letter to correspond to it, kind of like in a museum where you have the sign hanging up next to the piece of art. Um, and I'll leave these up here if you guys want to take a look at them at the end of our session. So we set up everything all over. And then we left the uh, program books you could see on the bottom there for families. And then everyone came in and the room was packed. It was also about 98 degrees. <laughs> it's not open house if you're not sweating, I guess. <laughs> and so we had families looking all over. And then the next day, after open house, because you figure, you said, I literally spent probably six hours setting up the room for this. And then say, like, and half an hour is done. Let's take it all apart. So we left it. You know, the next day, all the fourth grade classes rotated and looked at each other's exhibits, which was really neat, because the kids had all seen each other's, but here it is going to different classrooms, and they really enjoyed getting that opportunity to see what their classmates worked on. So, how did they feel about it? I know everyone's going to read my entire survey here, but I surveyed kids to see, with different statements, to see what they agreed with, and the standouts are that most kids agreed, or nearly all the kids strongly agreed with, I enjoyed the uh, Teach Us Something Somehow project, I was proud of my own project, I did my very best work on this project. How often do kids honestly say, I gave it my very, very best effort? Uh, degree and rich students reported the Tufts project helping them with various skills, and you'll notice none of them, on average, fell into the, nope, didn't help me decide, but the standards, creativity, determination to succeed, concentration, motivation, hooray! <laughs> So then I asked them, should Mr. Moss assign this project to his class next year? Why or why not? Yeah, their answer is 100% positive <laughs> feedback. It's pretty exciting. Yes, it gives you free reign to work on uh, anything with almost any topic. Inspire me to become a professional photographer. The student was inspired. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should assign it again because it's fun learning about new things you probably would not never have learned about if you didn't do the project. Project, which is true. We don't cover a lot of these things in school. Advice to a, a student who does the project next year. Make sure you manage your time well. Don't fall behind. Try a method that you've never tried before. Computers get bugs. <laughs> <laughs> Work a little bit every day. So the question is modify and teach us something somehow. How can you embed testing in your curriculum? Well, first of all, just do it the way I did it, but for a lot of you, it may not be a practical option for a lot of different reasons. You may not be able to make it a home-based project. You might have to have curricular connections. Whatever the case may be, it may not be a practical option for you. So how can you do it? There are a number of different ways. First, you could start small. Uh, there's a project that uh, we do. It's not even a project. It's actually an activity called um, Five Finger Research. And the idea is that the student, when they have extra time in their day, they uh, come up with five questions that they want to learn about, all about a particular topic. 
And then the teacher signs off on those five different questions, and the student is then free to go and start doing their research. So it's kind of like TUS in that they pick the, what they're curious about, but on a much smaller, manageable scale. The notes of the packet, we said, your project can be about anything. Well, inevitably, what happened is we had to make sure that it somehow fit into the curriculum. And unfortunately, all those research skills that I get into in the objective section aren't yet curricular areas. They need to be, but they haven't yet been included. So we had to find a way to really work it into the academic curriculum. So here's our revised version. We've done a lot of work relating to the 50 states. This project is your opportunity to focus on something that makes our country an amazing place. So now the topic can be about anything as long as it pertains to the 50 states. It was hard for me to make that leap because the whole project is predicated on student choice. But I thought, OK, as long as they can still do anything that relates to the 50 states, OK, you know, uh, what did we have? The Philippines in that first video. The Philippines would have been out, but I could still sleep at night. And we've had some really cool projects. We had a student uh, two years, three years ago, who did one all about the history of whoopie pies, <laughs> talking about what's too crazy to prove. It was a really cool project. He went and actually interviewed a baker who makes whoopie pies as their primary product. It was a really neat project. Uh, limited technology, and we kind of talked about that before. What do you do with this limited technology? There may be home-based options. Uh, at, at my school, once we started to get other classes involved, the teachers got really nervous. They said to me, John, I don't have a basement with 75 computers <laughs> that I could bring into school to play all these things. What do I do? And so what a lot of teachers have done is they say, if you're doing a tech-based project, you have to make sure you are able to bring in the technology needed to present it and to share it with the class. Again, that may not be an option for all schools, but that may be something that works for you. Can't have kids do it at home. You can do variations of this in class. You can have this be a class project where they're doing their research. You can give them websites to work off of to get their information and then maybe give them a choice of different methods that they can use so that you're keeping it something that you're able to manage. So how can you guys get it? If you go over to my website, which actually, see, I didn't even put on the right thing. I wrote TUS. It should be slash edtech. OK. And then here's a link to the presentation from today. Here's a link to the page of resources for students, which I showed you. And then here's where we have TUS resources for <coughs> teachers. And on this page, we have the presentation again. Here's an editable PDF assignment packet. So what you can do is you can put in your name, the date. You can change. Oh, I can't say school. There we go. You can change the topic. So if it can't be about anything, you can come up with what you want the new topic to be. For the methods, you can use my methods or add in some of your own methods, delete any that you don't want to allow them to do. So you can modify it so that it's appropriate for what you're trying to accomplish. Um, I also have the calendar that uh, I showed you before. If you need to convince others that TUS is really worth it, uh, the survey that I included uh, earlier is available for you guys to download. And that's where you can get TUS. I'm on time. Are there any questions? Nice job. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, two things. Sure. Um, go for it. I really try not to. Like, I will do everything I can because I explain to them, hey, I want everyone to be excited about your project. If someone just heard about Family Park and you're teaching them about Family Park, you know, and that usually well, helps I don't them think to make anything wrong with that. Oh, I'd be all good with Family Park. <laughs> Yankee City, I don't let anybody do it. Mother, oh, sorry, you had another one? No, and on the other one, have you ever had a student that just absolutely has no family support yes. at home? You have to differentiate as you would for any other, like the book okay. report. And then, so for those students, we did go towards something a little more simple, because the reality is, yeah, there are kids who make a video and a demonstration and bring in food and all these things. I had a student once who organized a field trip, an actual, like, we went to the Humane Society field trip. If you're doing it with the student, you may not have the ability to do that level of uh, depth until you come up with something you can't do. Yes? Did you have um, any issues where you had to, you had to do Typing in. And we spend a lot of time doing mini lessons about what's your topic, how are you going to get that information, how are you going to give credit to the sources. Really, it's, and for those kids who really have an extra time, let's be honest, can we call it tier one, tier two research skills? 
I mean, really, it is an intervention in that it's a tier one research skills. Tier one tusks. So, yeah, we absolutely do do it. And if you're thinking about helping kids to brainstorm, anyone of you know Jahari Winto? If you don't know it, I, I can't show up quickly, but it's what you know that you know, what you know that you don't know, what you don't know that you know, and all those things that you don't know that you don't know. That's a great way to help kids to visualize that. And some other questions. Yes, ma'am. Level, right. True. And that's an important piece, and we talked about that ahead of time, of, okay, if you're going to pick this topic, what resources are going to be available for you? And a lot of times I'll say to a student, okay, I'm going to tentatively approve this project, I'm going to sign off, but I'm not going to take the next week and start gathering sources and tell me how you're doing, and I'll make a note in my calendar to check in with that student. And again, we talked about responsibly handling problems and working with the teacher. I would have no problem if the student came up to me, hey, Mr. Moss. It, there's nothing here for me to make that change. And yeah, I'm also giving kids extensions based on that. Of, okay, we're starting from scratch again. You know, it takes a week to present all of these. You're going to present on Friday. I'm fine with that. Yes? How do you, um, as these are fourth graders, I have seventh graders. Okay. And I'm trying to teach them how to evaluate what's in Yes. And it could take me five weeks. Yep. I mean, it really is cute. So how do you... How do you go through that? Uh, there are a lot of standards that are being included. However, my wonderful student teacher, Mr. Warner, just did a terrific lesson about how do you evaluate the validity of a website. And I can, if you're willing, I can uh, take the uh, document that you made and put that up there as a resource. Um, I check. But there are a lot of other ones online. If you don't like ours, you can look online. They're terrific resources about website validity. Yes? So how many fourth grade classes are at your school? There are, this year, five. And all of them do that? All, all of them do that. To take one more, I think. Yes, ma'am. Mason Ladd, I'm sorry. And that's a big challenge. There are the kids who have too many ideas, who struggle in their attempts, and then there are the kids who can't develop their ideas, who really need that help. And we could do an interest inventory. Oftentimes, I'll reach out to the parents and get some background. Remember, we do it in the spring, so by then, I hopefully know enough different things about this group that can kind of point them in the right direction, make you joke, see what their interests are, T take a look at their writing over the course of the year to see what uh, some of their topics have been. You know, it's a teacher's bag of tricks. It's the same challenge we face when we give the kids a writing assignment and they say, I don't even really know what to write about. Same skills. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming. Everyone. I'm happy to stay if there are any other questions. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you.